today we're going to be talking about uh, the evidence for evolution. In this review video, we're going to cover what is a scientific theory and all the evidence that we have that evolution is fact. First, in order to start, what we need to discuss is some basic terms. You all know by now that evolution is considered a theory. It's considered the theory of evolution. A big misconception that people have with, with the theory is how people normally use it in everyday life. Most people say the word theory as a guess. You know, my theory is that uh, that John stole the phone from Juan, right? They use it as a guess as if they don't know anything. That's not quite factual in a scientific theory. A scientific theory has a lot of evidence supporting it. In fact, it has been tested over and over again, and it still holds true. To give you other ideas or another example of a theory, gravity is also a theory. We don't hear people say, oh, well, I don't believe in gravity because it's, oh, it's just a theory. They don't go jumping out windows. It's because it's something that we've seen time and time again. Evolution is a theory because we have multiple lines of evidence supporting its claims that animals change over time. So in this video, we're going to go ahead and talk about some of those pieces of evidence. One of the largest pieces of evidence that we have is our fossil record. Our fossil record can be uh, leftover remains of animals or even plants. Now, you already know kind of coming into the class that as you go down, if you look at my mouse, as you go down, the organisms that lived in that time frame are going to get older. The animals towards the top are a little bit newer. And what we are able to do at, and what we're able to see as we dig down through these layers is we find little bones. It's possible that you found fossilized remains uh, when you've been at your house or looking at the, at the beach, something like that. Fossils are everywhere. But what we can do and what we see in these fossils is when we look at one layer to the next, we see the basic same type of organisms, but we can actually see them changing a little bit, right? So remember that evolution is the change of organisms over time, and we could physically see organisms changing their appearance. I'll give you another example. If we take a look at these human skulls, uh, you can see that in, in general, they have the same basic shape, right? Going from uh, the Lucy that's over here and progressing towards what we are now seeing in our skulls as, as homo sapiens, our current humans. Now, when we deal with evolution, we're talking about large change in time. We have, you can clearly see that these fossils have some basic similarities, but as you go to the left, you found the mouse over here, you're getting more and more changes. You can see that the fossil of Lucy is the crane's very small. The snout is a little bit more out, almost like ape-like. Uh, and as you get towards present day, our skulls get a little larger. We can get a little bit bigger brains, and we see that the face kind of uh, is a little bit less protruding. You know, we can physically dig through the earth and see these fossils changing over time. But it's not just with humans that we can see this. We can also see this with animals. A good example of this is uh, something we call transitional fossils. If I go ahead and this image is a something called the Archaeopteryx. Now, I don't care that you know the name of that, uh, but if you look at it, you can clearly see that it has wing-like structures. Uh, so when people and paleontologists first discovered this organism, they said, hey, perfect, awesome, I found a new bird. But when they started looking at it, uh, they noticed that, well, there's also some claws on there. And there's also some other reptile-like features. And so what they're kind of determined is it's weird that we see these animals with both reptile features as well as bird features. We now know that, oh, let me zoom back in. We now know that the what ended up happening was that reptiles slowly had evolved feathers. They lost their scales, evolved feathers, and took to the took to the sky. In fact, current day reptiles, so snakes and lizards, amphibians, those are more closely related to birds than they are us mammals and humans. Uh, fun fact is that the dinosaur, the Tyrannosaurus rex, you guys can all picture that from Jurassic Park, uh, is a more closely related to the chicken than us uh, today, right? So chickens and T-Rex are kind of direct ancestors. Uh, and we call these transitional fossils, okay? You see transition, you know, if you transition from one place to the next, you can, you're moving from one place to the next. Okay, so we can literally see organisms changing over time, we can see organisms with multiple features kind of combined into one fossil. 
Another piece of evidence we have for evolution is something called a vestigial structure. Vestigial structures are something that an organism has, uh, but we don't really know why. Um, so it's a function, so it's a, an organ or structure that serves no function in an organism. Common example is the whale. Uh, if you look right here, the whales actually have what's left over of a pelvis. Okay, now your pelvis is essentially your hip bones. Uh, so that we kind of think about this, you know, why do whales actually have hip bones if they didn't actually use to walk? Um, they're not attached to anything. They don't help them swim. It is just kind of floating there in their body. So how we make sense of this, we say, well, they must have actually came from the land and moved into the water. You all know that whales and dolphins are mammals and they don't have gills. Well, it's because they started off on land and they moved into the water. Us humans have some vestigial structures as well. Some vestigial structures that we have is our, what's called the coccyx, which is your tailbone. Now, you all know where your tailbone is. Uh, that's not to say that we have a tail. It's just if we go back far enough, we all know that we're very closely related to chimps and monkeys because a few million years ago, our common ancestor actually had a tail. Uh, some other vestigial structures that we have in us humans is this little guy right here, okay, where I'm putting my mouse. Now, that's actually left over of a third eyelid. Okay, we've, You've probably looked in the mirror and seen that little weird mucusy looking thing and wondered, hey, what is that? What that actually is, if I scroll down here, you can see that aquatic animals actually have a thin third eyelid to help shield their eyes while they're underwater. If you look at some land animals like the cat, owl, okay, even dogs have this as well, you can see that they have a little bit left over third eyelid, a little bit larger than ours. Ours right here, very, very, very small. So we say that, you know, if you go back far enough in our ancestry, we see that, yes, that we did have a third eyelid. And again, that's not saying that when we were younger, we had a third eyelid millions and millions of years ago. Another piece of evidence or another vestigial structure we have is our raising hair. You guys all know if you get scared, sometimes you get goosebumps. Think about if an animal gets scared, uh, if a cat gets scared, their fur kind of sticks up. Well, if it sticks up, you will look a little larger. And that's actually, it gives you a little bit more size advantage and might kind of deter some people from trying to eat you or attack you. Uh, we also have homologous structures as evidence of evolution. You recognize the prefix homo there from the previous unit, meaning the same. Essentially, homologous structures are structures that are very, very similar, uh, but they're just modified in appearance. Uh, and this gives us evidence uh, that we come from a common ancestor. I'm going to flip through and get a better image here. Some common hom homologous structures that we see in humans uh, is the vertebrate forearm. If you look here, uh, you can see that it's kind of color coded. Uh, the brown right here is all the humors. That's your, the top of your arm bone. And you can see that the basic order of the colors are the same in human, horse, cat, bat, bird, and whale, and actually many other vertebrates, many other animals with backbones. And if you look at it closely and you count the number of bones in the wrist, count the number of bones in yellow, which you call your phalanges, we also see that, hey, that's pretty similar. So we kind of look at this and say, hey, how likely is it for us to have nearly identical bone structure if we didn't share an ancestor in the past? Uh, well, not very likely, and I'll give you an, another example here. If you look at our hands, for instance, if you look at the basic structure of our hands, and you compare that to our pretty close relatives, the chimpanzees and the gorilla, and even the panda, you notice that we, the, the basic order and structure is the same. Now, some bones might be a little thicker, like for the gorilla, because they're a little bit stronger, um, but we can directly see correlation between bone structure and similarities between us and monkeys, us and even other organisms. There's a lot of evidence that says, hey, why would we have these structures if we weren't related in the distant past? Another piece of evidence that we have for evolution is something called analogous structures. Okay. And now analogous structures are very different from homologous structures. Remember, homologous structures are structures that are very similar and give evidence of common ancestries. Analogous structures are structures that do not point to direct relations, okay? But 
they have similar functions. Okay, so for instance, let's take a look at example number one, the wing. Uh, if you're whether you're looking at the bat, uh, the wing of a bat, wing of an insect, wing of a bird, uh, whatever you're looking at, the, the common function of the wing is to fly, and everybody knows that. Now, insects are very, very, very different from these animals. They don't have bones, they're smaller, uh, their body structure is very different, yet we see that they have the same organs, like the wings, in order to help them accomplish different functions. So we look at analogous structures and they point to the fact that um, that natural selection, that nature, favors certain adaptations. Think of it almost like a problem to solve, right? The problem to solve here was almost like uh, being able to fly. Well, evolution came up with different wing structures that allowed different organisms to fly. They're all very, very different. Some have feathers, some have a flap of skin, uh, some just have just essentially a thin little covering, which is the insects. If you look at another example, the fins, fins are used to swim. Everyone knows that. Now, if you look at a shark, which is a fish, a penguin, which actually is a bird, it's just a flightless bird that evolved and that took to the water, and a dolphin, which is a mammal, again, three very different organisms. They have all evolved similar adaptations to help survive in their environment, right? All evolved the structure of a fin to help them swim. And again, so this does not indicate common ancestry like all the other pieces of evidence. However, it does indicate that natural selection, right, nature, favor, favor certain adaptations that allow organisms to be most successful in their environment. Another piece of evidence we have for evolution is something called comparative embryology. And you see the word embryo in there. And an embryo is just an organism that is not fully developing, but it's in the process of developing. Now, these so these are in utero being developed inside the mother. But if we look at the early stages of our development, whether you're looking at a turtle, a chicken, cat, or a human, you notice that's very, very difficult to identify which organisms are which. And, and you see that right here, we actually start developing, of course, a human, we actually start developing with a little bit of a tail. Right now, obviously, we don't have tails, and this is only very early in development, but they eventually kind of go away. If you look at these little parts right here, something called the pharyngeal slits, those are the formation of initially gills. Now, obviously, you know that humans and land-based animals don't have gills. So we see this and we're like, hmm, that's odd. Why do we start developing gills and not have one? I'll give you another example. These are even some more embryos. If you see it early in development, it's very, very difficult to identify which one is the human. As you progress towards uh, birth, uh, later on in development, you can see that's where we start getting some more characteristics uh, that we kind of recognize. If you look at this bottom row, it'd be very easily identifiable that this is a chicken and that this is a cat and that this is a human. But the very early stages, doesn't really even matter which one you're looking at. It's very hard to determine which one the human is. And it's because we develop in a very similar way. And we look at this and say, how likely is it if we didn't come from a common ancestor to develop in almost the same way for the first few weeks? That's not really, not very likely. If you look at yet another piece of evidence, and this is probably the strongest piece of evidence that we have, we have what's called genetic homologies. Now, we've already discussed uh, homologous structures, right? So the same structures, but kind of similar, but different functions. Uh, the very fact that all organisms use the same genetic code, use DNA, is evidence of evolution. We've talked about in prior units how DNA is made up of those adenines, thymines, guanines, and cytosines, and those end up coding for particular proteins. What we can see is with now that we can analyze the sequence of DNA, we can take a look at individual genes. And what we notice is in each gene, the closer we are to them, the closer we are related. So for instance, we are very closely related to the macaque, which is a type of monkey, or even similar to the chimpanzee. Uh, we can look at the same gene in us humans and them, and we say, hey, there's only about eight differences, eight base pairs. If you go a little further away, uh, 
of evolutionary relationship to the dog, you get a little bit more differences. And as you progress on and on and on, all the way to the lamprey, which is the type of fish, which obviously you know is pretty different from us humans, you get more changes in the DNA. Okay, And also, just the very fact that DNA is used and read by our cells in the exact same way is evidence of evolution. We, talk, we took about um, transcription and translation in previous units, how they make our codons and, and those amino acids. The very fact that the human's cells use the same genetic code and interpret the same codons the same way as the frog or fish is evidence of evolution. If we didn't come from a common ancestor, well, how likely is it that every living thing would use the same genetic code in the exact same way? Very, very unlikely.